Well, hello and welcome back to another one of our podcasts. It's been a little while. This is Hugh Waters over in Gloucestershire here and Phil calling in from London, I do believe, over there. Indeed. I'm, I'm, um, here I am in the work, Route 6 workshop um, all by myself. Um, uh, Wesley, uh, one of my, uh, well, my, my trainees, off uh, on a holiday in Grenada with his dad. And, uh, and 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 Matt, our audio specialist, is off. Uh, is off. I think demoing our KVM system to people this afternoon. So I'm all alone in the workshop, which makes for an ideal time to record our little session here. And uh, we've had something of a, a summer hiatus. Well, since our last podcast was in March, um, yes. we've had more than a summer hiatus. I felt very shamefaced when I saw Hugh at uh, at IBC, um, and we stopped for coffee, and we said we really got to start doing these again because it's been a while. Well. Especially as walking around IBC, uh, I bumped into quite a number of viewers. So uh, all of you who said hello, it was great. And um, yes, let's you know, keep on being in touch. Um, and thinking of it being a little bit of a pause, uh, Phil's come up with a topic for today, which harks back, he tells me, two and a half years to one of our first, or one of our very first um, podcasts, which was on the uh, naughty subject of fiber fiber 101 well i suppose this is as you said it might be fiber 102 uh we're going to update that fiber talk um phil tell us a little bit about what it is that we're going to be talking about and then take it away yeah so like, like you say we could refer you back to uh january the 26 2012 um uh the uh, the, f- the first um uh, podcast we did uh, fiber 101 and um, where we talked a lot about uh, cabling types and and sort of applications as well uh but the thing that's becoming um quite um uh, uh, prevalent um, for me at least in, uh, in the industry generally is this idea of CWDM coarse wave division multiplexing where using a single mode fibre you can pack many many wavelengths uh, down the same cable and uh, you know with with I mean you hear, hear everybody uses the expression dark fibre with a with yeah. dark fibre you can you can send multiple things um, long long distances and uh, up until now the kind of people who would sell you equipment to do that um, uh, would charge you proper sort of uh, telco type money. Uh, but in the last, I would say, couple of years, um, the, sort of the big players, you typically Nevian, uh, a Norwegian company, and, uh, and Everts, big American sort of broadcast stroke uh, um, telco manufacturer, um, they've kind of given way to sort of, uh, one smaller manufacturer who, who, who I went to visit in September in Norway who do um, CWDM equipment, as combined as a larger product range. And so I thought it's, it's, it's an interesting area. I, we, sh- we should maybe talk about it a little bit. Yes, definitely. And the idea of plumbing things through fibre is uh, becoming uh, less esoteric and, and uh, exotic and rather more normal these days. So I, I presume you've been, you guys have been shoving fibre into facilities for... Oh, decade or more I suppose but uh... 2005 we bought our first machines and started doing it and that was really in response to the fact that we saw fibre done badly a lot and so we thought we mm-hmm. can do this sort of optimally and, and well so uh, we, we, we started using Tritec fusion splices but then we've now moved on to using Ino cladding alignment splices um, core alignment splices, sorry, the Tritex are cladding alignment, the, the, the owners are core alignment. Um, we talk about that a lot in the first podcast, but, but um, here's, yes. a, here's a, a, a very typical kind of uh, um, uh, sort of fiber optic type converter used a lot in broadcast. That's, a, that's just a, a cheap and cheerful, kind of couple of hundred quid, Mr. Black Magic's, um, you know, 3G video in and out to fiber yeah. in and out. Now, you'll notice the fiber module on this, on this little converter here. Look at, you know, these are the kind of converters that you strap to the back of a cable tied to the back of a monitor. Very common, you know. Mm-hmm. The, the, there's this little adapter piece in the back there, which if I pull out, um, is, is you know, leaves a sort of a standard kind of hole waiting for it to go back in again. Um, this is what they call an SFP. Uh, SFP, small form protocol, I think it stands for. And this one is... It's, t- it's 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 badged by black magic but undoubtedly it's probably manufactured by finisair or somebody like that and if you look very very hard with my kind of failing eyesight if i look over the top of my glasses it says 13 10 nanometers so 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 if i get close to the camera can can you can you see that hugh maybe um, i'm still seeing on desktop oh okay uh, okay no yeah. worries it's a 13 10 nanometer uh, sfp and uh, yeah. and so that tells us it's 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 a single mode sfp so it's expecting, uh, uh, you know, that very skinny single mode cable to go a long, long distance, uh, not a multi mode cable. Uh, you know, those, those those much fatter, more sort of commodity based, um, you know, extending your SAN 
uh, kind of fibers. Yep. This is this is a single mode fiber, which was the original way they did fiber, um, and is still you know preferred for across campus or between premises type applications. And in fact, single mode fiber tops out unamplified, unrepeated. It tops out at eighty kilometers. So so, really? so long, long way. Um, and I, I, I suspect this is this is a, one of the cheaper ones, which tops out at twenty kilometers. There are sort of three three graduated standards. Uh, it's unlikely that that something that costs you two hundred quid would come with the ability to drive an eighty kilometer cable. But you, you know, they're, 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 they're just twenty a, kilometers is pretty impressive. Yeah, so. yeah, that'll that'll do me from you know one side of the studio to the edit edit rooms. You know, just just kind of around the other side of the campus kind of thing. Uh, but you, just as a, as a little kind of uh, refresher, multi-mode fiber has that very large center core, uh, which allows multiple modes of light to travel down the cable. And single-mode fiber has that very, very skinny core, nine microns, nine, nine millionths of a, of a meter, which perfectly contains the beam of light so that the, the light can travel much further and you can modulate onto it much, much greater uh, um, you know disturbances to, to, to carry higher data rates. So even a single carrier, a multi-mode cable can carry 50 gigabits per second. You know, 80 kilometers. You know, huge data rates, huge distances. Multi-mode fiber, they kind of top out 500, 600 meters. So okay for within campus applications, but not yeah. for, for for long distances. Uh, and 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 because they're much easier to manufacture, the cable has traditionally been cheaper. Although those differences are becoming less important now, and and you can you can fill a multi-mode fiber with a, either a modulated LED or what they call a V-cell, a v- vertical cavity emission laser, which is a solid-state laser, which is you yeah. know integrated onto a piece of silicon. Um, and in fact, people say to me, "Well, what, what what does that mean, multi-mode? What are the modes of light that travel down a a multi-mode fiber?" And and here's a diagram. Uh, and 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 we really are getting getting into the. Uh, this is this is really quantum stuff. This is superposition states, and so it's not different wavelengths that travel down the fiber. It's different modes, and you can kind of think of that in the way that the light is launched down the fiber, the angle of attack of the fiber of the light down the fiber, and and that actually produces uh, these different sort of modal dispersion patterns within the fiber, uh, and you can put multiple ones of these down the fiber. So 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 this this diagram kind of illustrates. How those modal properties work, you know, and and with the right schemes, you can modulate many many modes of light down a single fiber, all at the same frequency, so the same color, but but all with these different modal dispersion patterns going down the center of the fiber. Now, so you can detect the dispersion pattern at the far end. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and so that that means that that, that that's why you can buy a three hundred dollar um, fiber channel card to go in your PC. And that fiber channel card to the operating system looks a bit like a SCSI adapter. And and so those 32 bits of SCSI uh, bus, width of SCSI bus, essentially each one of those bits is modulating a different mode. And so that's why it's it's such a cheap thing to manufacture a, a fiber channel card. Um, uh, but so, 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 so in one sense, people think, oh, well, surely I've got multiple signals going down a multi-mode fiber. Well, you have. They're all traveling at the same wavelength, 850 nanometers typically, <coughs> although there are there is one other standard. Um, uh, 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 but it's, it's exploiting this 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 modal dispersion characteristic. You know, really is kind of superposition and quantum type effects going on. Um, you know, there, there's a there's there's a, a dispersion pattern kind of live, as it were. Um, and, oh, I see. Yeah. And so it's it is quite kind of clever stuff. Uh, compare that to single mode cable. Single mode cable. Uh, typically, um, you know, like so, so this little black magic um, converter that comes shipped with a uh, an SFP that does thirteen ten nanometers. And if you've got another one of these at the other end with a thirteen ten nanometer SFP, connect one to the other, and, and they'll talk to each other. And, and you know, video in on this one appears as video out on the other one, and vice versa. Um, and in fact, there's a standard for that. Uh, Simpty, oh, can't remember. 297 colon 2006 and so this this black magic converter could hang off a fiber that was hanging off a miranda router for example or or any uh, any other broadcast manufacturer that's conformed to that standard oh so that's an interesting thing uh, if i'm trying to think about what will plug to what the interoperability what am i looking for what kind of clues am i looking out for uh uh uh, uh that that standard um smpt um um uh, 297 colon 2006 <laughs> Um, if memory okay. serves, and uh, you know, but every time I've used one of these with uh, Mr. Miranda's router, or with um, uh, who else's equipment? 
Oh, I'm struggling now. But, 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 but generally speaking, nobody manufactures <clears throat> something that doesn't conform to the standard. Why, why would you? Um, and so, yeah. for example, uh, NBC Universal, they, they have a big uh, Miranda router with, with fiber optic I.O. and these sitting downstairs in their theatres. And, and right. so, so, you know. However, that's, 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 that, so this is a single mode device. The, the, the thing about single mode fiber uh, is that, um, so imagine that 1310 nanometer um, uh, wavelength going down that cable. Uh, 1310 nanometers are the, the, the bandwidth, you remember speed of light, yeah, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. The bandwidth is in the order of 280 terahertz. I mean that's just a phenomenal bandwidth, isn't it? You know, you think about our little, our yeah. tiny little three gigabit per second video signal, you know, or our ten gigabit per second Ethernet. You know, it's sitting in a in a in a carrier that's capable of two hundred eighty terahertz, um, and that's kind of two hundred and eighty terahertz. And that's kind of Gosh. hidden from us a bit, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah, we yeah. we always think about, you know, when we're talking about video, we're talking about a four point five gigahertz cable carrying a three gigabit per second signal, or we're talking about you know, Ethernet, and engineers are familiar with the bandwidth of the cable and the data rate they can push down it. But when we get to fiber, we start mm. talking about, about wavelengths. Uh, and, yeah. and so that kind of hides from you the fact that, that, that a, a single mode fiber cable has got a truly gargantuan wavelength available. And so, you know, starting in the 1970s, the late 70s, this, there's this idea of um, wave division multiplexing where why don't we just multiplex multiple signals onto different wavelengths and optically combine them and stick them down our, our, our nice fiber cable. And it's taken really until 2002 before that was kind of ratified into standards where, you know, one manufacturer's equipment would work with other manufacturer's equipment. There's, there's an old fashioned Nortel uh, optical multiplexing chassis. Oh yes, I see. And, mm -hmm. and just, just bear that in mind. So what, there's maybe eight U of equipment and a three U power supply. And that's really what you needed until very recently to do what we call coarse wave division multiplexing. Why is it coarse? Well, um, because we quite like to do it with cheap equipment. We quite like to do it with the thing I've got up here, which is a, a CWDM multiplexer. And, and this model by uh, this company I was telling you about, this Norwegian company, Barnfind, is a 500 nice. pound piece. It's a 500 pound piece to multiplex multiple fiber wavelengths onto a single fiber. And in fact, if I find ah. my picture there. So, just, oh, yeah. No, go on, go on Hugh. Yeah, and that previous shot, yeah. the uh, uh, where the back of the things, you, you, yeah. there was a different uh, wavelength for each of the inputs. Is That's that right? Is that yeah. right? So, so the, 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 they are ah. the channel spacing uh, for for a CWDM fiber, and you can get eighteen um, uh, wavelengths on a CWDM fiber. Uh, this is this is a really quite a, you know this is the budget um, multiplex. This only has eight inputs, uh, but right. actually. Uh, if you look at that diagram there, that shows you the center frequencies of all the um, oh, wavelengths yes. available. And, you know, it's bi-directional. So some of those could be going one way up the fiber. Some could be going the other way down the fiber. And, uh, you know, just with a, uh, with a, with a, um, a very simple uh, passive optical device. And you can see I've, I've taken the lid off one here. And you can see <laughs> there's no electronics inside. It's all optical engineering. And so those... Those, all those, so this is the more elaborate ones. This is 16 channels. You can see 16 optical yeah. channels. And they all pass through these tiny, tiny little dichroic splitters and recombiners and then all wind up on a single fibre there. How extraordinary. So it really is all done with mirrors. It, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or prisms, I suppose. But uh. Well, in fact, they also, they also do optical switches and they really are a tiny little prism on a voice coil. And, in fact, people make optical switches, which are a bunch of tiny little prisms on voice coils. Uh, which are literally just switching the optical signal, so you don't have to take it back to an electronic. Suppose they're on voice calls. They're not um, not using the, uh, the the sort of matrixed mirrors from uh, what was it the the, the TI um, uh, chips used in projectors. They may well do. They may well be equivalent to DLP type construction. I've not seen inside yeah, one of those. You. I just assumed it was a voice call because that's how you make a tiny thing move, isn't it? Um, yes. But uh, yeah, you may well be right there. So so we've now got this concept of coarse wave division multiplexing, where we can send uh, up to 18 uh, optical carriers uh, down a single fiber. And, and that's well established now. That's a, uh, uh, you, you know, all manufacturers have agreed on these, on these uh, wavelengths. And, um, you know, it's becoming quite common. And th th this can then go on to another level where, where you know, if, 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 if 18 channels on your fiber aren't good enough for you, then we get into this whole idea of dense wave division multiplexing. 
but because that uh, requires much more precise channel spacing and actually goes further outside the band that CWDM uses, um, it's kind of more expensive and there's more active optical uh, parts used in a, in a, in a, DWD, in a DWDM, dense wave division multiplexed, uh, multiplexer or demultiplexer. But stop the press, you can squeeze 192 channels down a single fiber. And so um, it's very widely used uh, for things like, um, so, 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 so if you think about um, uh, oil and gas exploration platforms, uh, they still, they, they have a lot of cameras monitoring everything that's going on on the platform for, for safety reasons. And uh, the law in Norway, and I'm assuming elsewhere, is that you have to have an operator monitoring on the platform, but he has, he's, he's mirrored by an operator on shore monitoring as well. And so a fiber optic cable snakes under the ocean up onto the monitoring center on shore and they need to be able to watch all 100 plus cameras that the operator on the platform is watching. And typically this yeah. is how they do it. They do it with a DWDM system. Ah, now, the other big thing about DWDM is because it's all a lot more precise uh, and things are much better defined and more importantly, the, 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 the sidebands are much, much, nice, much more nicely shaped and controlled. Um, mm. uh, you can use these things called iridium doped fiber amplifiers to boost the signal. And that's why uh, DWDM can go long, long distances, not just the 80 kilometer limit of, of CWDM. Um, so, so if you think about um, the way they, they do transatlantic fiber routes, they're all um, DWDM with iridium doped amplifiers under the ocean, you know, with these nuclear powered batteries driving them. And, uh, and, and so, uh, so a CWDM is, is rather limited by the fact that you're using single mode fiber and that tops out at about 80. Uh, uh, the, 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 these are both, these are both single mode standards. DWDM and CWDM so both right. only run down single mode fiber. Um, uh, CWDM is, is it's coarse. Uh, so he's, he's using bad language around the place. <laughs> no, it's, it's so, 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 so the, the, the sidebands on each of the carriers are not particularly limited. Um, yeah. And uh, and it's 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 all a bit more kind of you know you can use a passive multiplexer um, like like uh, uh, that gadget there with just entirely yeah. composed of optical components and um, you know useful useful if all you need is up to eighteen channels down a single fiber DWDM block. Well, what expensive. you can't do presumably is take eighteen, put it into one, and get uh, and shove that one into into another one, a sort of daisy chain. Well, if I tell you that the, the, the multiplexer and the demultiplexer are exactly are identical components, uh, you know, it's oh, right. it's either a, it's a, it's a multiplexer or a demultiplexer depending on which end of the cable it is, and in fact, it's doing I both see. jobs because you might be you're sending signals one direction and signals the other direction. So this is literally putting things onto a fibre, or if there's something, they're already splitting them off. So so these little optical parts here are optical bandpass filters. They're little dichroic. Right. Pieces, so a bit like the dichroic block in a camera that can sh can filter out a bunch of wavelengths, and, uh, and 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 so once you've put your signals through a CWDM multiplexer, you have a fiber that's pretty well stuffed. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you, tr you try to do that again, and you just wind up uh, overwriting stuff within the channels. Ah, right. Yeah, it's it's kind of akin to, you know, VHF radio. You know, you can tune along yeah, the yeah. dial, finding what's there, kind of thing. Okay. So, so no, 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 fine. Um, so uh, that's and, and, and so here, here, here we. So, so um, that's 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 another that's another manufacturer's one of those, you know. And you, you can see his SFP hole there. I'm waiting to take an SFP. The thing about um, uh, uh, CWDM is that so here's 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 another um, S, a picture of an SFP I've got up at the moment and you might notice that this SFP has got uh, 1350 nanometers written on it 1350 nanometers 40 kilometers so this SFP is good for um, uh, you know kind of half the maximum distance and uh, it has uh, it's rated as a 1350 nanometer device unlike the one that came in our black magic which is rated at 1310 in fact 1310 is the one that everybody uses if they're not into CWDM I could take this 1350 nanometer um, SFP and push it into this black magic box. I've tried that and it works. Um, so, so in a sense, on the electronic side of the house, you know, the copper side of the house, um, it doesn't really care. Uh, you know, sort of in there, it doesn't really care what 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 frequencies of light are going to get modulated and pushed out of the of the optical outputs. Um, you, know, you just have to kind of consult the label to see what flavour of of SFP you've got. Now, yeah. 
the, the thing about SFPs is the, 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 the wavelength really only matters on the transmit side. So if you if, if for example I've got this and I know it's transmitting on 1310 nanometers at the other end I might have another one of these exactly the same and and that has to receive the 1310 nanometer signal. Now the receiving SFP um, is colorblind when it comes to the receiving signal. So it wouldn't care if I'd used a 1350 nanometer sender at one end and a 1310 nanometer receiver at the other end because SFPs are colorblind. They don't care what what um uh, what wavelength of signal comes in they're looking across the whole band to see what they can see which means that uh, if you started to load things up onto a fiber cwdm style you really do have to have a multiplexer and demultiplexer at each end because if you just yeah. if you multiplex a bunch of stuff up onto a fiber and then try to do things with that signal ooh, equipment just wouldn't be able to make any sense of it so you've got to have uh, you know a demultiplexer at the other end oh, and you right pick off the, the frequencies you want to be able to say to a receiving piece of equipment, oh, and there you go, Mr. Video Receiver number five, there's your wavelength. Mr. Video Receiver number six, there's your wavelength. Uh, and and it's not just video that we send backwards and forwards up 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 this um, this kind of magic of CWDM. You can put any any signal you like, and and depending on the equipment that you, you you're using, I've got up a picture now of an of an SFP that has uh, uh, video connectors on it. So you don't even have to buy one of these, which turns video into into fibre. You can actually get video SFPs, which will slot. Oh right, straight. so that just takes SDI straight in and, and and make it flash the light. Actually, these are BNCs, so it will take lots of things. It will take uh, MADI. Uh, some of them will actually take analog video as well, and they've got little A to Ds and D to As on the SFP. All the magic happens. <laughs> in, um, this company does them with HDMI ins and outs on the SFP mm -hmm. so and, and 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 so if you send uh, uh, an SDI signal through a, a, the, th through a, a data router to this uh, to, to, to an SFP that's got an HDMI output on it the, the HDMI SFP says oh this is YCBCR data but I'm coming out HDMI and I know that the monitor that's connected to this is an RGB HDMI device and so it does the color space conversion on the SFP so SFPs wow. have come a long long way so I've got next to me this is a blinking heavy bit of equipment this is an old school fiber channel switch, uh, you know, probably from 10 years ago. That really is quite heavy, even though it's only one U big. And um, yeah. there's an SFP I've pulled out of that. And if you look at that, that says um, sing, uh, multiple mode, 850 nanometers, two gigabit per second. So that's quite a modest old school SFP. But that, that was just really intended for fiber channel. But there are a whole range of SFPs now. And I think. The broadcast world really is cottoning on to this idea that you can do everything via an SFP and then you plug the SFP into something like this, which is a bunch of holes, a bunch of SFP holes. Internally, this, this has got a little 32 squared router that really is agnostic about what you're pushing in through those SFP holes. So you, know, you could have some video on there, you could have some Ethernet on there, you could have some fiber channel, you could have some InfiniBand or whatever other you know synchronous broadcast signals or non-synchronous data signals you wanted and they'll all get routed via this 32 squared agnostic router and then you can then send them out on on sfp holes but more importantly you can then run them into a a, a, a multiplexer demultiplexer in fact there's one built into this this is this is my demo unit here there's one built in there mm -hmm. and so using cwdm cwdm sfps you can run all those signals into the multiplexer and extend that across town to you know your other facility, the other side of town, or your facility in London can share its video matrix with a facility in Coventry. It all comes down to the yeah. fact that you have to have an availability of a dark fiber, but just one dark fiber, mm. just a single strand of, of optical so fiber. So if you're if you're if you're wiring a facility or maybe connecting a studio to a control room or something like that, you can drastically cut down the amount of uh, uh, cabling between places by having by modulating and demodulating. Yes, and and I would say nowadays that that you know the cost of these SFPs they're all sub sub a hundred euros now, um, really does make copper cable look quite expensive. You know, I mean, well, so I, I'd especially buy... by the time you add in lots of Wyman time and yes, and... indeed, um, interesting. Uh, and, and so uh, I th you know I th I, th I think. Um, you know, this is definitely where things are going, not just from an extension technology point of view, but just an economy point of view. Uh, you could imagine mm. that maybe you're expending, extending your television facility and you, you'd acquired another floor of a building or, or the building next door or whatever. You know, yeah. Very, very quickly, in short order, you know, so long as you've got a single fibre going up to that other floor, you can very quickly take you know, a dozen video feeds, 
the corporate network, the phone network, the KVM network, the production network. You know, they can all go up on a single fiber. Um, and, uh, and, and just by having kind of one of these cheapest chips, 500 pound demultiplexer, and a, a bunch of breakout boxes that take the SFP feed and break them out to different things. And by the way, these little boxes also come with dual SFP holes, so you could you could pluck off your network feed and all that kind of stuff. It suddenly gets very wow. affordable. And um, the time to deploy is absolutely minute. I mean, if you were literally, if you'd taken a place over, you could throw some temporary cables up and, and do your dressing at some other time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, so 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 that's. That, that this is all, you know, in the single single mode domain, uh, and uh, you know, kind of makes a lot of sense for people if 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 they're, you know, not only extending long distances, but also, you know, they just just need that that rapid deployment kind of thing, um, and uh, it's kind of it's, it's it's what I principally demonstrate a lot at the moment. You know, uh, I was at Formula One today. You know, the, the the motor racing people, they're very interested in all this. Now I can see why. Um, we've got one customer, big um, football club, and. Uh, They've only got they've got a limited number of fibers between their stadium and their post production facility, which is in their admin building, about half a mile away. And currently, it's just their BT line that runs over two fibers to and from the editing facility. And but the idea of being able to uh, have proper DR and and locate a lot of their equipment in the nice air conditioned controlled DR being disaster disaster recovery, re- disaster recovery yeah in, in in the stadium is very appealing to them. And now we can offer them that we can say okay we can send you know many many digital videos in both directions and all four different kinds of networks and this that and the other over that single fiber and we'll use the second fiber as a backup and in fact we can even have an automatic fiber failover switch that will that will you know when one fiber gets chopped or whatever it falls over to the next one um, and you'll be down for you know milliseconds so uh, you know this this whole kind of thing of doing things in the optical domain is is really sort of catching on now very very interesting indeed and that's all CWDM. Um, yes. Is CWDM limited to about 18 inputs? Yes, CWDM is, yeah, absolutely. It's only defined for um, uh, 18 uh, wavelengths. Uh, uh, but, but you have to go up to DWDM if you want uh, you know, that 192 channels of goodness. Uh, but that gets, yeah. starts getting quite expensive. Um, but for, for facilities world, 18 gets you quite a long way, and two fibres gets you... Uh, 36 <laughs> yeah and you're still not spending a fortune so and if you consider uh, how much dark fiber there is underneath london uh which you know yeah. in, in the dot-com boom of 15 years ago there was a big push to get lots of fiber uh in, mm-hmm. you know into, uh, under london and you can't go between television facilities in in soho in the middle of london uh without being more than 100 meters away from a point of presence of either level three or or bt or or um, cable and wireless you know they're everywhere uh, and in fact, we've been talking to uh, one of those big fibre providers, and it turns out that there are lots of direct connections between Soho and Pinewood Studios, and so oh, uh, that makes a very compelling case. Don't send equipment and people to Pinewood if you've got a two-week studio shoot, you know, because you can you can send all your ISO camera feeds back to Soho, and mm. some networks and some some you, you know the KVM network for the GUIs and and everything else over mm. a single fibre. And yeah. traditionally, renting a single fibre is, is at an all-time low now. I think, I think you know, so long as you're near points of presence, renting a single-mode fibre is hundreds of pounds a month, uh, you know, which that, that, that's like just a couple of taxi fares, you know. It's yeah, uh, yeah. Between, London and, between London and Pinewood Studios, you know, so it makes a lot of sense. Yes. I think there was, uh, I was involved in something a couple of years ago where they were putting fibre in. The only difficulty is getting way leaves and, and sort of the legal requirements, but the technical yes. requirements are actually very straightforward yes no absolutely so the other couple of little sort of fiber update things i wanted to mention was um was uh a you know, couple of views down a fiber microscope so so oh, yeah. fiber microscope is a little little gadget i carry a lot in fact if i just if you excuse me a moment i'm just going to reach behind me and grab mine so i was doing a um just doing a bit of um fiber auditing work for a customer yesterday who wanted to know um, how good their fibre was between two buildings within within Soho, and uh, mm-hmm. and so that's that's a very simple test because uh, that's just a uh, here's a single mode test pair. So one emits light at a, a calibrated laser wavelength and and strength, and and that measures it. So it's a, it's a very quick and easy thing to do to oh, test, um, you know, the quality of a fibre. But the things that the kind of things that cause fibres to degrade are are typically con- contamination. <clears throat> and what you've got up on screen at the moment is a couple of photos taken of 
fibres which I put in at a facility in Manchester um, and then I came back a couple of weeks later and they had building work done and these fibres hadn't been capped up properly and this is builder's uh, dust on the end of the fibre. Oh, so that's what we're looking at is dust. Well, yeah. Dust. So, so, so there's the there's the uh, there's the overall cladding of the fibre. There's the transmissive mm-hmm. core in the middle. Given that the transmissive core is about half the size of the overall cladding, that will tell you that's a multi-mode cable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was, and so so this is measured using this fibre microscope gadget, where you you look down the fibre microscope, and uh, could I? <laughs> No, not quite. You look down the fibre microscope with the fibre attached to the, to the end ferrule and yeah. uh, and you see the kind of crud that accumulates on the end. So so this fibre here, you can see there's a big splodge of dust right over the transmissive core. Yeah. And so we were getting like maybe 20 dBs of loss down that fibre because, of course, the light comes out and it's just immediately scattered by a piece of dust. Mm-hmm. So then we use something like this. It's called a cleetops, and it's a, uh, it's a bit like the, the old uh, roller towel, uh, you know, in the gents' toilets of yesteryear, mm-hmm. where you literally you, you press the, the, the lever down and that brings a new bit of, of, of uh, sort of um, dampened, you know, isopropanol damped lint-free wipe into, into view and you, 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 you wipe off your fibre and then you release the, uh, the, um, the thing and it, and it winds that past and you can replace the cassette in there. for oh, much. And so that picture there is a single swipe of the cleat tops and then looking again at the yeah. fibre again. So we go from that, unusable, to that. You know, very, very usable, no trouble there at all. Just using the, uh, the cleat tops... Um, yeah, but I mean, there's lots of you know, lots of different manufacturers make these things, um, but without the fiber microscope, you can't you kind of hard push to uh, to sort of see that. Um, so that was one thing I wanted to talk about. <coughs> the, the the other little fiber update was um, how we measure fiber. So as I, as I mentioned mm. already, that using those those owl light meters, we we send a, a known uh, signal strength down the cable, and we we see what we get out at the other end, and. That's actually a really effective way of measuring fibre. You can use a, a time domain reflectometer. Uh, we've got a Fluke DTX 1800 for that. But all that tells you is if, there's, is if there are breaks along the cable and they tell you how far they are. Once you've got an installed fibre that you know is solid end to end, then just measuring the response of the fibre is, is just fine. And so the way we currently do it is uh, the, 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 um, it, the, the OWL optical tester is, a, is an LED source at a precise yeah. level. It's, an, it's not a real laser, it's a solid state laser. And it, mm-hmm. and it floods the, the fibre with, with light of our desired frequency and, and, and that fills the core. And actually, it also fills the cladding around the core. And so that isn't perfectly opaque. So you do get some transmission of the test light oh, right. down, the, <clears throat> da- down the cladding of the fibre as well as the core of the fibre. This is referred to as, as, as fibre overfilling. Um, mm-hmm. Now, if it's data, it's not so bad because you'd rather have more signal than less signal. You'd rather have better signal to noise than worse signal to noise. But for, yeah. but for, for certifying a fibre, actually, it, it gives you very misleading results. Well, potentially misleading results. You can get up to a, a, a one and a half dBs of extra signal read from your fibre than you would if you did it properly. And so that's referred to as, as, as overfilling the fibre. Or sometimes the problem is referred to as the, the problem of, of um, encircled flux um, uh, overfilling because we're, we're, right, know, okay. our flux is encircled, as it were. And so yes. ideally you want to use a laser that only fills the centre of the core but a laser-driven um, test set is not a £300 test set like we all like to carry around. It's a £3,000 test set. It's a much more precise ah. device. Yeah? And, and, so, and so measuring to avoid encircled flux uh, is becoming a bit, bit of an issue. So people are starting to specify that, that, that for, for, for measurement of fibre, you know, we want you to have, have accommodated this. And there are several ways of doing it. Um, there are special launch cables that have been manufactured so that the, the cladding is entirely opaque doesn't let any of this extra light through oh, right, there's okay. these things called uh, fiber mandrels <laughs> a great word and they uh, all they do is is they um is they uh, you, you you wrap your test cord around the mandrel and uh, uh, apparently the additional um uh violation of the bend radius at the cladding uh, is that so obviously the cladding has been you know from an angular point of view is bent a bit more than the core is and so that that reduces the effect of um uh encircled flux 
uh, in the cladding, but okay. not so much in the core. And the mandrel is, is, is calculated. So if you wrap it around whatever it is, four or six times, you've reduced the, the cladding transmission to an acceptable level. And then there are these things called uh, mode conditioning patch cords, which have a little optical piece in them, uh, yeah. which stops it there and then dead. And they're a bit more expensive yeah. than the launch cable uh, technique. But with the mode conditioning patch cords, you have to do, you have to have like additional um, uh, splices at each end to do that. So there's sort of three methods of testing fibers more thoroughly to avoid this problem of encircled flux um, overfill. Uh, and, and, and you're testing the fiber as if it was exactly the sort of the laser application that was that was firing down the fiber. So that's yeah. that's 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 just another little interesting addition that we never really covered two and a half years ago. It's kind of something that's come up recently. In fact, I learned all about this at a a Cat Eight training day, which we went to recently in June. Um, uh, Cat Eight is this new signal, this new cable standard, which mm-hmm. um, uh, you know is a cable that's that's um, certified up to sixteen hundred megahertz. And is, I've only just started seeing Cat Seven going in, so good yeah. gracious, you're ahead. Well, well, well they're, they're the standards bodies are ahead of everybody, aren't they? <laughs> and so, and so, Cat exactly. Eight is is supposedly the cable we'll all be using for doing 40 gigabit Ethernet and those kind of standards. So we'll, we'll maybe talk about that in another podcast because it's it's yeah, yeah. it's an interesting business. The uh, the standards bodies are uh, hard at work all the time. So. I mean that's that's really all I wanted to talk about in this one. It's um, wow. It's those developments within fibre. Um, CWDM. I think it's very significant. I think we'll be seeing a lot more of that. And uh, and and it's the kind of thing that it's been around for ten years. It's only in the last two years there's been equipment where uh, you know each endpoint is sub ten thousand pounds. You know the the, the big players like Nevian yeah. and uh, and Everts. You know they've been doing this for a while, but it is expensive endpoint equipment they sell, and it's the smaller manufacturers that are starting to produce, you know, affordable, um, you know, so a few thousand pounds to do, you know, uh, endpoints and break it out to sixteen videos at each end, that kind of thing. Really, really interesting, especially if you're um, uh, either designing a, a new facility from scratch or bringing one up to date. Um, this is really fascinating stuff, and I think some you've you've got additional stuff on on uh, on your blogs, um, and I think on the notes you've probably got some resources for people to go and look at. But uh, this is going to be a, a subject that's going to be popping back for renewal, perhaps from time to time. I should think. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I, I had a bit of a dry period over the summer where I didn't really write much of my blog <laughs> at all. Um, but um, no, I have. I've, 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 I've sp- Viewed lots of lots of nonsense about about fiber um, over the years. Um, I find it quite an interesting subject. You, you know, it's kind of sufficiently yeah. different from all the considerations of copper cabling. And until I started getting into it, my my just general engineering training hadn't really told me much about it. So uh, there you go. Well, fascinating, Phil. Really, really useful. So uh, yes, I hope I hope other people found it useful. I, I can't wait to uh, put my BNC crimper in the on the shelf and. Get out my little microscope. I have to say, I think copper cable is going to be with us for a while yet. Uh, I suppose so. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, there's always the, the, there's always the uh, the big uh, the big um, um, you know investment of, of all the endpoint equipment for fibre. <clears throat> you know, it's not doesn't answer all the questions. The thing I wanted to talk about next time um, is mm. uh, I, I was going to give it some some cheesy name like the challenges of modern pitch quality analysis, um, and a lot of um, uh, problems that we deal with now are. The time domain problems. So there's a picture there um, from um, the Disney production of Alice in Wonderland, and uh, you can see that, uh, they, that that's what we call iframe corruption. So there's, 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 a, there's a problem in the MPEG stream there, and and if you have a corrupted iframe, uh, you know, which we'll, we'll we'll talk about all that uh, when we do the next mm. podcast. Um, the, so given that the iframes make up the bulk of the data load of a video stream, um, it can sometimes it can take a whole group of pictures to get to the next iframe, so you can rebuild the picture. So you're seeing fragments from old old groups of pictures and new macro blocks that have just shown up because they were available uh, and and so it's just one example of of um problems in the time domain and there are lots of them uh, and so we'll go through a few ways of of being able to Ooh, do yeah. sort of compression measurements um at the monitor front rather than having to get out an expensive roden schwartz compression meter um We'll talk about some of the things relating to chrominance resolution and how you can measure if those have been impacted by a compression encoder or by a 
um, uh, you, you, you know, a, a, a single pass through an editing workstation, for example. And so hopefully things that the, the, the broadcast engineer will find useful in terms of testing the temporal domain with video. That's kind of something I'm yeah. quite into at the moment. Oh, looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. Well, we won't make it so long next time. Uh, we won't make it six <laughs> months. We'll do it uh, in the next couple of weeks, I think. If you're up for it, Hugh. Okay. Always up for it. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Nice to see you again, right, chap. And uh, we'll talk and soon. And you too. Speak soon. Join Cheerio. Me.